Deep in the heart of the Amazon jungle, along the eastern bank of the Tapazos River, several large abandoned warehouses sit in total disrepair among the area's native foliage and wildlife. Beside them, a large water tower, once the tallest structure in all of South America, overlooks the remnants of a town that was, not so many years ago, alive with activity. However, now, instead of polished, shining silver, the town's metal tank is rusted and brown. Near the river's edge, painted onto the walls of a collapsing boathouse, faded yellow letters spell out the words Bendindo a Fordlandia, or Welcome to Fordlandia. This is the current state of a town that was built less than a century ago for a seemingly simple reason. The harvesting and processing of natural rubber to be exported and used by the world's growing automotive industry. When it was envisioned, the town's designer, industrialist and automotive magnate Henry Ford hoped that it would stand for generations and offer opportunities to the local Brazilian population that would long outlast his own life. It had on-site accommodations for workers, commissaries, a state-of-the-art hospital, plentiful entertainment, and everything needed to operate independently of other nearby settlements. As a concept, the town seemed as if it would be a dream realized for Ford. However, as evidenced by its now overgrown streets and the abandoned, bat-infested homes and businesses that line them, this dream town, which still proudly bears his name to this day, was not meant to be. Uh, Forlandia's peak in the early 1930s, it housed over 3,000 Ford employees, but by 1990 that number had dropped to less than 100. These were the last remaining descendants of the town's original inhabitants, the ones who chose to stay after the town's demise. But where did the project go wrong, and what exactly led to its downfall? Well, in the town's early days, there were resource shortages, strikes, and countless other setbacks, but those things were common in startups, and Henry Ford had a reputation for solving problems. So what prevented Fordlandia from succeeding, and why couldn't Ford, a man with seemingly an endless supply of money at his disposal, solve the town's problems and rescue his dream from failure? Well, to understand the fundamental problems with Fordlandia, we need to first attempt to understand the complicated man who created it. And this is because Henry Ford was the town's sole visionary, and his views on capitalism, the middle class, workers' rights, and the role that employers should occupy in the lives of their employees all played pivotal roles in the town's creation, and certainly its demise. In the years that immediately preceded Fordlandia, Henry Ford had already spent decades building his reputation and establishing himself as an accomplished entrepreneur, inventor, and businessman. Today, he is viewed as one of the largest players in the American Industrial Revolution, and in the late 1920s, he was most well known for owning and operating the Ford Motor Company. This company was Ford's pride and joy, and he micromanaged nearly every aspect of its operation. Even in his later years, after he had officially handed the reins over to his son Edsel, Ford still retained the right to veto any decision that he did not agree with. This is because, when it concerned matters of business, Ford felt he knew best, and most of the time, he did. Under his supervision, the Ford Motor Company had seen unparalleled levels of success, and by the 1920s, over half of all cars in use within the United States had been made in one of his factories. And this success wasn't an accident. Years earlier, Ford had revolutionized the manufacturing process by being the first person to effectively implement a full assembly line into his factory's production process. This is what had allowed him to cut costs, maximize output efficiency, and begin dominating the automobile market. Instead of outputting one car every 12 hours as was standard, his workers could do it in one and a half. This level of productivity was impressive, to be sure, and nobody could question Ford's ability to turn a profit. However, the changes he made to his factory's layout paled in comparison to those he made on behalf of his workers. Now, to be clear, while Ford was famously anti-union, he did claim to be pro-worker, and while many people today would consider these two stances incompatible with one another, he backed up his words by making several drastic changes that benefited his employees in major ways. As the sole decision-maker at the company, Ford became the first person to institute what he called the $5 wage, which meant that he would pay a total of $5 to each worker for a single day's work. In 1914, this amount was unbelievably generous and pretty much unheard of. It was more than double what most of Ford's direct competitors were offering. But the changes didn't stop there. That same year, he also reduced his employees' working hours by implementing a six-day, 48-hour workweek. Once again, this decision was met with great skepticism by his competitors, as most other companies were in the process of increasing their employees' work hours to maximize output and offset the effects of the 1914 recession, which had been caused by the start of the First World War. They simply 
could not imagine paying so much money for so little work and believed that Ford's poor decision-making would mark the end of his success and possibly the end of his entire company. However, as we know, that didn't happen, and Ford saw his factory's output increase. As it turns out, workers tend to work harder when they feel their compensation is fair. But fair is a massive understatement. Once those changes went into effect, Ford's employees were among the most well-compensated laborers in the country, which, as you can imagine, made a job at one of his factories a highly coveted position. It also made his factory workers fiercely loyal to him, and soon, while other companies were struggling to retain employees and fill positions, Ford had a line of applicants waiting to be interviewed. He also knew that the middle class was a key player in capitalism, and that if workers had extra money to spend, the economy could keep growing and thriving. That was good for his workers, but it was also good for the rest of the country as well. Without overselling it, the changes Ford made were revolutionary for the working class, and although he remained staunchly opposed to any type of union behavior until his death, he also set a precedent that many other companies were forced to follow to remain competitive. A decade later, the Ford Motor Company further reduced working hours to the now standard five-day, 40-hour work week, and once again, despite many predictions that this strategy would be the end of Ford's business, it wasn't. Every year, the company continued to grow, as did the popularity of his Model T and Model A cars. However, Ford didn't get everything right, and these improvements to his employees' lives came with a few major caveats. First, Ford was notoriously intrusive into his employees' private lives, and he demanded that they live as he saw fit. He looked down on gambling, heavy drinking, tobacco use, and other vices that he saw as detriments to a person's health and moral character, and forbade those working under him from engaging in such activities, even when outside the workplace. To keep track of who was obeying company rules, Ford established a social department wing of his business and employed at least 50 private investigators to follow and document what he saw as bad behaviors. For the employees Ford deemed to be of good moral character, he offered many rewards, such as profit sharing and increased privileges within the company. But to those he saw as unfit, he offered little, sometimes choosing to fire them outright. By today's standards, dictating what an employee can and can't do during their off hours is obviously seen as overstepping several boundaries. But that was not always the case, and in Ford's mind, there was nothing malicious behind his actions. He subscribed to the concept of paternalism, which is the belief that people in positions of power and authority have a moral responsibility to oversee the development of those that are socially beneath them. Today, most people reject these ideas, but they were very prevalent in Ford's day, and they did not completely fall out of fashion until sometime around the 1960s. In truth, as many at the time claimed of Ford, automobiles were simply a byproduct of the Ford Motor Company. Its real product, Ford believed, was people. He didn't see his employees as mere laborers to be used and discarded. He saw them as groups of people in need of guidance. He had high standards for them, but those standards were just a part of the job, and most people were willing to put up with the intrusive requirements simply because his working hours and pay were so generous. So, despite his flaws, Ford helped usher in a new age of prosperity in the post-World War I era, and his changes were overall very good for the American worker. However, Ford was not infallible, and his indiscriminate meddling in his employees' lives would end up being one of the greatest detriments to Fordlandia's success. Now, by the late 1920s, the relatively young automotive industry was beginning to experience growing pains, and one of the largest sources of those pains was the increasing price of raw materials due to various worldwide shortages. To remedy this, one of Ford's longtime goals was to own and operate a supply line for every resource the company utilized. If he could establish these supply lines, he believed that he could end his reliance on outside suppliers and ensure that his cars maintained their affordable reputation. By the mid-1920s, his goal was really close to becoming a reality. By then, every single resource needed for his cars, from the glass for their windshields to the lightweight alloy steel for their bodies, was being produced by the Ford Motor Company, all except for one, the rubber for their tires and gaskets. This was the final bottleneck in Ford's supply line, and he had spent years attempting to find a viable alternative without luck. Eventually, he nearly gave up. However, a shakeup in the rubber trade was about to thrust this nearly forgotten goal to the forefront of his mind. During the early years of the Industrial Revolution, most of the world's rubber supply was being exported from the Amazon rainforest, primarily from Brazil and other nearby South American countries. 
their venture into this market had started in 1879 when rubber first became a highly sought after commodity due to its usefulness in the production of hoses, shoes, industrial belts, and around the turn of the 20th century, bicycle tires. At its peak, at least 90% of the world's supply of natural rubber was coming from Brazil. However, around 1900, Britain began to construct their own rubber plantations in Malaysia, Sri Lanka, and parts of tropical Africa, all of which were then colonies of the British Empire. By 1910, these plantations were fully operational and exporting latex in higher volumes and at a fraction of the cost of the Amazonian rubber. This allowed the British Empire to quickly take control of the entire market from this point onward as the plantations in Brazil gradually closed shop due to a lack of demand. For a time, these new plantations were good for the automotive industry. However, after several years of dominating the market, worldwide rubber prices had fallen too low. In response, Britain's then Secretary of State for the British Colonies, Winston Churchill, decided to restrict production to artificially drive the prices back up. In less than a year, the cost of rubber went from 20 cents a pound to $1.20 per pound, a 500% markup. This caused Ford and other businessmen to once again start searching for new sources. First, Ford turned to his longtime friend Thomas Edison to produce an alternative, but Edison's formula never proved viable and the venture fizzled out after multiple setbacks. The following year, he considered building a plantation in the Florida Everglades, but this also fell through after word of his business plans leaked and a local Florida investor purchased the property out from under Ford. This investor then attempted to sell the property to him at a higher markup, but Ford decided to look elsewhere out of principle. And then, in 1926, he found exactly what he was looking for. That year, while reading former president Theodore Roosevelt's published memoir, memoirs of his explorations through the Amazon rainforest, Ford learns that Roosevelt had visited the area's rubber plantations at a time when they were still thriving. Ford himself already knew of Brazil's history with rubber, but what really piqued his interest was Roosevelt's declaration that the area was ripe for industrialization. He said it would require significant investments into infrastructure in the form of roads, railways, and telegraph lines. However, other than those few things, all the area and its inhabitants needed was proper leadership and guidance. Based on this information, Ford decided that Brazil was his best bet, and he firmly believed that he was up for the challenge of industrializing it. And I mean, after all, why wouldn't he be? His so-called radical policies on employee pay and benefits had allowed his factories to prosper despite his competitor skepticism, and the success and widespread adoption of the automobile in North America could be attributed to nobody but him. He knew that establishing this plantation would be challenging, but if Roosevelt believed it could be done by someone with gumption, then he would be that someone. In one swift move, he was going to completely undermine Britain's monopoly, breaking up the rubber cartels once and for all, and produce all the cheap rubber that his factories could ever need. It seemed doable, but Ford's motivations for this venture were not entirely driven by profit, and this is where his philanthropic and paternalistic mindset took over. Knowing that building a plantation in the middle of the Amazon meant that he would also have to build an entire town for the workers who would eventually staff it, Ford saw an opportunity to drastically improve the lives of his future workers, the vast majority of whom would be native Brazilians. He could build modern houses, shops, schools, hospitals, and everything else the area was lacking. He believed that the town could serve as a shining example of what he referred to as American excellence and teach a country that had yet to go through the Industrial Revolution how modern work was done. In this way, Ford could both harvest the rubber he so desperately needed while also helping to elevate an underdeveloped country into the modern world. In Ford's mind, that realization settled the matter. His town, Fordlandia, as it would eventually become known, would be a reality. And once the idea had taken root, it would require more than a few minor setbacks to dissuade him. So. To scout out a suitable location on which to build and grow, Ford contracted a surveyor to scout out an area in northeastern Brazil. He had several key requirements for his land, but paramount among them was access to a waterway as this would be the only way in or out of the area until bridges and railways could be established. Months later, after reviewing over 22,000 square miles of rainforest and visiting several potential sites, the surveyor returned with a location that was approximately 500 miles inland and situated along one of the Amazon River's tributaries, the Tapazores River. Satisfied with his findings, Ford met with officials from the Brazilian government and, after extensive negotiations, signed the paperwork to acquire a 2.5 million acre plot. For reference, that's approximately two and a half times the size of the state of Rhode Island. Surprisingly, this parcel cost Ford little money up front because Brazil's government was eager to see the area put to use. However, as part of the arrangement, Ford did agree to pay 7% of his annual profits to the Brazilian government and another 2% to the local municipalities after 12 full years of operation. Eager to visit the property he had just acquired, Ford announced that he would soon tour the area in an airplane with Charles Lindbergh. However, numerous setbacks caused this trip's delay and the idea was eventually scrapped. 
All his planning for the project would be done in the United States, over 4,000 miles away from the future worksite. As Ford began that planning, he and his advisors had one word in mind. Efficiency. When Brazil controlled the markets, the rubber trees they planted were spread out, which made harvesting a chore. But Ford had no intention of returning to the old ways. If carefully allocated, he had sufficient land at his disposal to harvest enough rubber for over two million cars each year, and he envisioned plantations with groves that stretched as far as the eye could see, their trees packed as tightly as the roots would allow. This is the way the plantations in Asia were run, but there was a major difference. The Amazon's wild jungles were untamed and, consequently, unmanageable. Thankfully, however, Ford had more than his fair share of resources at his disposal. Tractors, saws, and mills could make quick work of the area's landscape, he believed, all of which could be fully assembled in the States and transported to the worksite by boat. But those machines weren't the only items that would need to be transported, as Ford was unable to rely on any locally sourced products or resources. That meant that every single building material needed to construct Fordlandia would have to be transported from America, across the ocean, up the Amazon and Tobias rivers to the future construction site. And when we say everything, we mean everything. Concrete mixers, stone crushers, backhoes, electric generators, shovels, picks, and hand tools of every kind were all needed, and those were just the things to tame the land. Prefabricated buildings and building materials would need to be constructed, transported, and placed where they needed to be in order to assemble larger warehouses, machine shops, docks, businesses, and homes. Plus, they would need everyday essentials for the workers, such as clothing, hygiene supplies, medicine, and food. Eventually, Ford knew these items could either be grown and produced locally or transported by railway, but establishing a reliable supply line would take a significant amount of time. As such, supplies for the railroad, including a fully assembled locomotive, would need to be shipped as well. All of this sounded overwhelming to most of the project's advisors, but Ford was the king of logistics. He knew that transporting so much in a timely manner could be done if he found a large enough ship. And as it turns out, two large ships would be required, the Lake Ormac and the Lake Farge, a decommissioned lake freighter and a tow barge that Ford purchased from the US government for a hefty discount. After taking ownership of them, both these ships were stripped and repurposed to suit Fordlandia's needs. But Ford's philosophy of treating his work as well once again came into play here. He knew that the journey would be long and tedious, and that his workers and their families would likely have to live aboard the ship until the houses that he had planned for them could be constructed. So the Ormac was equipped with a large dining area, a laundry facility, a water distillation plant, and a hospital with accompanying operating rooms, as well as a chemistry lab, a library, and private quarters for each passenger. Once they landed at the work site, they would build an area known as the Villa Americano, a neighborhood that offered its managers all the comforts of home. Running water and electricity were first on the list, but other public amenities such as swimming pools, tennis courts, libraries, cinemas, and a golf course were all on the agenda as well. To connect them all, Ford wanted a paved road system illuminated by streetlights for his cars to drive on. The project was a monumental undertaking, and bear in mind that all of this was to be constructed within a country where the vast majority of people didn't even have access to clean running water. The whole process would be an uphill battle from start to finish. When choosing who would occupy this paradise, Ford had to make several difficult hiring decisions, as whoever he chose would be working largely independent from him and with little direct oversight, something that, as a micromanager, made Ford a little bit uncomfortable. And although he had committed to hiring Brazilian locals for most of his workforce, his managers would all be American, each one hand-selected by him. This way, he could choose people he knew would uphold the company's rigid standards on personal conduct, something else that he planned to enforce from an ocean away. He also chose a doctor, a chemist, an engineer, and other people to fill several administrative roles aboard the ship and in the town. So, in 1929, Ford put his grand plan into action by hiring a group of Brazilian locals to clear the forests in the area where Fordlandia would soon stand. In total, 1,300 workers were hired to start, and they quickly established a simple work camp that could serve as a base of operations until the supply ships arrived from the US. However, their troubles began almost immediately. Since the camp didn't have access to the most basic forms of sanitation, including running water or a proper waste disposal system, illness and disease quickly spread among the workers. As they lived on site, large landfills formed that drew mosquitoes, which brought with them a malaria epidemic. Without proper facilities to treat the infected or bug nets to keep out the mosquitoes, sickness spread freely, and after just a few weeks, hundreds of Ford's newly hired workers were laid up in bed and no longer able to work. But the dangers 
It didn't stop there, as the forest's floors were also teeming with venomous wildlife such as snakes, vampire bats, and other creatures that were hard to spot. Since most of the men worked barefoot and without leg coverings, this posed a huge problem, and with no hospital on site to treat the injuries, a small on site graveyard had to be established to lay to rest over 90 of Ford's ill fated employees within the first year. But this was just the first 90. To make clearing the forest safer, workers inexplicably turned to fire. In their minds, the wildlife could not harm them if the wildlife was dead, but this reckless approach had even more unintended consequences. Since kerosene was used as an accelerant, flames rose to over 100 feet in the air, and many workers suffered severe burns as a result. Additionally, the heat produced added to the already unbearable 105 degree temperatures, which resulted in numerous cases of heat stroke. According to eyewitnesses, the flames were intense, and ash and embers occupied the air like snow and hail. While all of this was happening, another issue miles away was surfacing that involved Ford's supply ships, the Ormac and the Farge. They were currently en route and transporting the town's managers and the supplies needed to construct the town. But they were late. Unfortunately, unbeknownst to the ship's captain and crew, they had started their journey south just as the driest part of the year was setting in, and when they reached the Tapas River, they discovered that its navigable width had shrunken to a mere nine feet. Neither of the 50-foot-wide ships that Ford had purposefully built for this journey would be able to pass until the river's water rose during the area's rainy season, which was several months away. While deciding how to proceed, the ship's captain, Einard Oxom, and his crew were forced to dock and wait near Santarum, a town that had been settled by the Portuguese approximately 200 years prior. Here, they attempted to wait for signs that the river was rising. However, due to an unexpected drought, the water level just continued to recede. Wanting to delay the project further, Oxon decided to begin unloading the ship's cargo onto barges that were small enough to be sailed upriver. He then hired a crew of local Portuguese workers to sail and unload these barges at the camp. But this process was maddeningly slow, as the person in charge of packing the boat had loaded the cranes and pulleys needed to unload the ship underneath the rest of the cargo. Taking the time to correct this mistake, including paying the Portuguese workers, ended up costing the company an additional $130,000. Plus, all their effort failed to save a significant amount of time, as when the smaller barges arrived in Fordlandia, the Portuguese sailors then had trouble unloading the equipment as the docks the Brazilian workers had constructed in anticipation of their arrival were too small to hold the heavy cargo. All of the docks had to be rebuilt and and reinforced, and a language barrier between the two groups made this an incredibly difficult task, which of course resulted in even more delays and more lost money. Eventually, when the waters finally rose and the bulk of the crew were able to sail to the main camp, everything had been unloaded, but that was the only good news. To say that they were disappointed by the amount of progress that had been made was an understatement, as the Brazilian workers' method of clearing the forest had been a disaster, and much of the space that they had hoped to use for planting had been scorched and ruined. Half-burned trees littered the area, which would all have to be cleared and disposed of. Additionally, the structures and living quarters that the Brazilians had built for themselves were primitive and unsatisfactory by the American manager's standards. Most workers were sleeping in hammocks suspended near piles of trash, which were drawing mosquitoes and worsening the malaria problem. Overwhelmed, Ford's team of managers elected Captain Oxarm to take charge of the situation, and although they had more than enough work on their hands, they could at least celebrate the small victories. They'd made it to the work site in one piece, the equipment was unloaded, and they could finally begin constructing the town. Despite the project's rather rocky start, by 1930, approximately two years after work in the Amazon had first begun, Ford's managers had reached several major milestones, and the land around them was beginning to take shape. Where nothing but trees and a few small huts once sat, smokestacks, docks, heavy-duty steam cranes, and other staples of large industrial work sites now stood. In the center of the camp, which by this point could now easily be called a town, warehouses, shops, and homes alike stretched in long, neat rows, uninterrupted by a landscape that had been thoroughly wrestled into submission. Surrounding the entire area, groves of tightly packed rubber trees were finally, after a multitude of delays, being planted. Further inland, the managers' homes had also been constructed in the Villa Americano, and while they still did not have indoor plumbing, the supplies for that endeavor were on the way via the now fully constructed railroad, which connected the town to ports along Brazil's coast. Soon, the rest of the amenities that had been promised would be added as well. The library, golf course, full-size swimming pool were scheduled to be completed by the end of the year. As for the workers, whose number had now grown to over 3,000, they were benefiting as well. Instead of a makeshift campsites, they were all now living inside fully furnished homes and bunkhouses, homes for the married men and women, and bunkhouses for the unmarried. Nearby, a large cafeteria offered full-service dining and acted as a spot for everyone to meet, relax, and share meals in the mornings and evenings. And in the center of town, Fordlandia's crowning achievement, its hospital, was now built and accepting patients. 
Fully staffed with doctors and nurses, equipped with state-of-the-art x-ray machinery, a surgery room, and a full trauma center, everything from snake bites and broken ankles to malaria, and hookworm could be treated with relative ease. Combine this with new sanitation protocols and rigid health standards such as mandatory vaccinations and periodic physicals, and for the first time since the project's inception, it seemed to many that the town might actually succeed. However, not every change was well received. And behind the scenes, another set of challenges was quickly emerging. First, although many of the Brazilian workers were now experiencing a higher standard of living than they ever had before, many were not accustomed to how work was done within an American-style company town, and adapting was easier said than done. Time clocks, strict schedules, and whistles that announced the start and end of the workday were all foreign concepts to them. Yet overnight, they were expected to alter the way that they'd been working for their entire lives. To give you some idea of just how disruptive these changes were, most Brazilian workers preferred to work a split shift, several hours in the morning and several hours in the evening, with a large break during the hottest part of the day. However, this type of schedule frustrated Ford's managers to no end. They expected the Brazilians to start work before the sun was up and continue working until the day's work was done. This was not only aggravating for the workers, but it was also dangerous, as heat stroke continued to be a major problem. Additionally, to protect from injury, all laborers were assigned uniforms, which included full-length pants and boots. This only exacerbated the heat problems. Most men preferred to work barefoot and without leg coverings to help stay cool. When the workers tried to bring their concerns to management, they were promptly ignored. The Americans refused to adapt the town's work schedule to suit the local climate, and this was for no other reason than they refused to bend the metaphorical knee to the Amazon. This is something that will, unfortunately, continue to be a problem as time goes on. The next major issue was Ford's inflexible restrictions on his employees' private lives, and this one was even more divisive. Just as he had done in America, Ford outlined all forms of gambling and drinking, as well as certain pastimes that Brazilians enjoyed, such as soccer and dances, that Ford and his managers deemed inappropriate. As an alternative, square dancing lessons were offered, but the Brazilians were not interested. To enforce these standards, a local security force comprised of private investigators similar to the one Ford utilized in the United States was established to monitor residents and conduct routine surprise inspections of company property, which included private living spaces. As you can likely imagine, these inspections were not well received. To help circumvent the new rules, traders from out of town opened stalls and shops along Fordlandia's borders that offered fresh produce, meats, clothing, and entertainment items such as books and magazines. Further upriver, a small island settlement jokingly referred to among workers as the Island of Innocence also became a popular after-work destination as it was home to several bars and brothels. Managers were unable to step in and close these establishments as they were outside of their jurisdiction. Next, as I mentioned earlier, to keep his employees healthy, Ford required everyone in town to report to the hospital for periodic physicals. However, many of the Brazilians thought that these exams were invasive and unnecessary, and some even took personal offense. One remarked that Henry Ford must believe them all to be filled with worms in need of eradication. In truth, based on his writings, Ford was legitimately concerned about the health of his employees, especially after the malaria epidemic that had spread throughout the camp a year earlier. And as strange as it sounds, the residents of Fordlandia and the town itself were slowly morphing into a passion project for Ford. As he had done for his workers in Detroit, the town's hospital was open to everyone, including locals who were not employees, as Ford wanted everyone in the area to have access to quality healthcare at a decent price. He believed the exams were good for his workers, but the workers didn't see it that way. And they weren't the only ones getting frustrated. According to letters written by Ford's managers, the team of Americans were also discontented with the state of the town, primarily because it was still falling short of what Ford had promised. As Americans, they had given up all the comforts of American life to travel thousands of miles to a largely unsettled land to struggle and fight for survival. And the challenges they were facing, as well as the constant pushback from workers, were, for lack of a better word, just overwhelming. They felt cheated and they made sure to let Ford know this while requesting across-the-board pay raises for all the town's managers. But this request was denied. In retaliation, many managers began skimming off the top and altering the company's books in whatever way possible to take the compensation they felt they were owed. In turn, this led to worse conditions for the Brazilian workers, who soon found out that their food budgets were reduced and their requests for essentials, such as the replacements for broken equipment or new farm animals, were denied. It was a tough situation for everyone, and after years of living with these tensions, the town was quickly spiraling toward a breaking point. So, throughout the first few years, 
of work in Fordlandia, the years when the town was just being built. Managers and workers butted head often, and some protests and strikes occurred, but overall these disruptions were relatively minor. For a time, it seemed as if there was a battle taking place between all the residents of Fordlandia and the wild Amazon jungle itself. It was a battle that united workers and managers by pushing them to fight toward a common goal. However, as the jungle around them receded and the town emerged, the rift between Americans and the Brazilians that had always been present began to widen. By late 1930, Henry Ford had become somewhat dissatisfied by the state of the town, which was hemorrhaging money. To remedy this, he sent a group of new managers from his more successful factories in the United States to provide a fresh perspective. These new managers didn't help. In fact, they made it much worse by being even more dismissive than the old managers and instituting even more unpopular changes and regulations that continued to ruffle feathers. One of these new managers was a man named Chester Coleman, and he was hired to oversee and run the town's kitchen. However, before Coleman had even arrived in Fordlandia, he had already made plans to overhaul the way food service was performed and fundamentally change the menu without consulting anyone who could have told him that the changes would not go over well. First, when he arrived, he found the kitchen to be unsatisfactory and ordered the construction of an improved cafeteria, one that could serve more people more efficiently. His design was based on cafeterias that had worked in the United States. However, once again, arrogance and a refusal to account for the differences between the United States' climate and the Brazilian climate made this change a failure from the onset. The town's old cafeteria was an open-style wooden structure with a straw roof and abundant ventilation that allowed a breeze to lessen the day's oppressive heat. But the new design didn't consider this. It was a large concrete building with a tar roof that trapped heat and made the air feel unbearably humid. And things got even worse as the next change was a policy one. Essentially, due to cost-cutting measures spurred on by the town's rampant corruption, employees learned that their meals would also no longer be free. Instead, a set amount of money would automatically be deducted from their bi-monthly paychecks to cover the cost of their food, and those deductions were not voluntary. Whether they ate the company food or not, they would be charged for it. And that meant employees lost their ability to choose what and when they ate. They were beholden to the menu that Coleman created, and that food was awful. Gone were the meals that the workers had grown accustomed to, as their trays were now filled with bland oatmeal and canned peaches for breakfast, and their dinners consisted of a mix of unseasoned rice, wheat bread, and whatever, if any, cheap meat was available. This change was inspired by Henry Ford's own personal diet, a diet that he believed kept him healthy and active, but the Brazilian workers absolutely hated it. But the final and most consequential change occurred when Coleman announced that the new cafeteria would no longer offer table service. Let me explain. In the early days, once the original cafeteria was established, food was served to workers at their tables by waiters. However, after Coleman's policy changes were enacted, comfort was abandoned for increased efficiency. Now, instead of coming in from a hard day's work to sit, relax, and be served their food, they were expected to line up and wait for it. This was taken as yet another insult, and as innocuous as this change sounds, it was the final straw. One night, when dinner service was particularly slow, a long line of workers began to form, and labor workers, who just wanted to sit and relax, became agitated when it seemed as if the cafeteria workers were purposefully moving slowly to delay their eating. This is when a brawl broke out in the lunchroom between two groups, and as the crowd of unruly workers slowly morphed into a mob, there was nothing that security could do to calm down the agitated crowd. Feeling that their complaints were going unheard, the workers began throwing their empty trays over the counter, dumping the large pots of bland food onto the floor and smashing the tables and chairs to pieces. The cafeteria workers fled, but outside the mob continued to grow. They drew knives, fetched hammers and machetes from the tool sheds, and gathered makeshift weapons such as steel pipes and rocks. They destroyed the newly built cafeteria and sent its workers, including Coleman, fleeing into the jungle for their lives. They smashed the tables. They smashed the chairs, and when they ran out of things to smash around the cafeteria, they moved on to the rest of the town. They set fire to the records office, looted the company stores, and damaged or destroyed much of the workshop's equipment. As they marched further down Main Street, telegraph lines were cut, windows were smashed, and the machine shop was damaged. In one of the more symbolic acts of retribution, the riot has also burned, flipped, or sank every single Ford automobile in Fordlandia before turning their aggression toward the time clocks. They smashed them to pieces before damaging the railroad tracks and setting fire to the train station. Further inland, inside the American village, the evacuation of the town's managers and their families began as soon as word reached them that a situation involving a few unruly protesters had developed into a full-scale riot. As smoke bellowed in the distance, men, women, and children alike fled into the jungle or across the river using whatever method was available to them—horses, paddle boats, canoes, even by foot. 
By the time the workers reached the American village, it was mostly abandoned, and when the few remaining managers heard the crowd shouting, Brazil is for Brazilians, kill the Americans, they quickly fled as well. In just a few short hours, the town had fallen into chaos, and its leaders were nowhere to be found. Many were hiding in the forest and waiting to be rescued by boat, but thankfully for them, someone was able to notify the government of the uprising. As soon as the Brazilian government received word that a revolt had taken place in Fordlandia, they immediately dispatched a military detachment from a nearby army base, and within two days they were on site to restore order. While facilitating negotiations between the protesting workers and the management team, the workers told the army officers about the poor working conditions that they had been forced to endure and the injustices that they'd faced throughout the years. The army leaders then brought these concerns to the managers, but they were uninterested in caving to the workers' demands. Like Ford himself, they were wholeheartedly opposed to any form of unionization or collective bargaining, and Ford had even threatened to shut down his entire company before caving to the protesters' demands. So instead of improving working conditions, they fired the leaders of the riot and requested that the army forcibly evict them. The army did as they were asked. On Christmas Eve of 1930, three dozen Brazilian soldiers armed with machine guns descended on the town and began rounding up protest leaders and any belligerent workers who refused to disperse. They then marched down the riverbanks, driving away the unofficial merchants who had been supplying the town with contraband and permanently closed the brothels and bars on the island of innocence. Once the dust settled and the accountants were able to tally the cost of the damage, an estimate of $25,000 was sent to Ford for his approval. That's approximately $456,000 in today's money. Ford son Edsel signed the check, repairs were made, and new workers were hired, and Fordlandia lived on for a short time longer. Now, throughout the town's short lifespan, residents had faced a multitude of setbacks, but there was one major problem that we've yet to address, and it was by far the most problematic. By 1933, five years after breaking ground in the Amazon, not a single drop of rubber had been harvested or exported from the town, and not one of the Ford Company's motor cars had benefited from the entire endeavor. Now, normally this type of turnaround was expected when undertaking such a massive project. After all, it takes six full years for a rubber tree to grow from a sapling to a full-sized tree capable of being harvested. But by simply taking one look around the plantation, it was obvious that something else was very wrong. You see, despite the Brazilian climate's ideal conditions, all the trees in Forlandia's many groves appeared small, malnourished, and underdeveloped, and their leaves were plagued with some sort of blight that was causing them to go brown and appear rotten. These were problems that bedeviled the managers and workers alike. All of them were unable to figure out why the trees would not grow. To add to the confusion, other natural resources such as teak, balsam, mahogany, eucalyptus, hemp, cinnamon, palm, pineapple, bananas, soybeans, coffee, and many others were all growing without any issues. These were the side projects for the town, but the stark difference between their success and the rubber trees caused great concern for Ford, who ended up sending a plant pathologist to Fordlandia to identify any overlooked problems, and unfortunately the news wasn't good. That pathologist's name was James Weir, and he identified a problem that had been overlooked since the town's inception. It was a problem that revealed the entire operation had been doomed to fail from the start because, once again, Ford and his managers had underestimated the Amazon rainforest itself. You see, while Ford had always intended to emulate Britain's plantations in the Pacific, what neither he nor his staff knew, primarily because no one had bothered to consult an ecologist before planning the multi-million dollar venture, was that the Amazon rainforest could not support the type of plantation they hoped to build. As we discussed earlier, when Brazil first dominated the rubber trade in the 1800s, the rubber trees were sparsely planted, and this was for a good reason, because the Amazon is home to many insects and fungi that love to eat and latch onto the leaves of rubber trees. By leaving a significant distance between each tree, the bugs and funguses had a very difficult time spreading. However, by packing the trees into tight rows, the whole plantation essentially became an all-you-can-eat buffet for caterpillars, mites, and the blight that had spread undeterred. To remedy this, workers tried washing the leaves, pruning the trees, even manually picking off the bugs by hand, but nothing worked. According to those that worked at the site, you could watch the bugs jump from one tree to another, and as soon as you picked one off, two more appeared. Because of this, the saplings were perpetually stunted. During his stay in Fordlandia, James Weir suggested using everything from soap to sulfur to drive away pests and eliminate the blight, but nothing he tried worked, and each year brought with it more setbacks. Eventually, as months went on without progress, new seeds were imported and new methods of cultivation were attempted. However, despite the best efforts of everyone involved, nobody could force the rubber trees to grow because, as it turns out, their original method of cultivation had disrupted the delicate ecosystem around Fordlandia by allowing the bugs and mites to feed and reproduce undeterred. 
it was an unsolvable problem, and in 1934, six years after the first trees were cleared to make room for the town, a recommendation was made by Weir to abandon Fordlandia entirely. Because of the chaos seen throughout Fordlandia's short operational period, many of the town's struggles have either been lost to history or told from the warped perspective of the American managers. So unfortunately, we'll never know every struggle that residents, particularly the workers, encountered. However, what we do know is that Fordlandia was indisputably a nightmare for everyone involved from start to finish. After abandoning the town that they'd worked so hard to build in 1934, another settlement called Belterra was established approximately 70 miles downriver, less than 25 miles from San Jerem. Here, Ford's employees hoped to take advantage of a fresh start, and for a time, the new town did have some luck in producing and exporting some small amount of rubber. However, in 1945, synthetic rubber was developed, and the demand for natural rubber absolutely plummeted. This made the entire town irrelevant almost overnight, and in November of that year, the town's managers boarded a ship and set sail toward home. They didn't even announce their departure. Workers awoke to find the manager's homes abandoned. Two years later, Henry Ford died, and the Ford Motor Company, then under the control of Henry Ford's grandson, Henry Ford II, sold the entirety of the company's holdings in the Amazon back to the Brazilian government. He estimated that his grandfather's losses were at least $20 million or $339 million today when accounting for inflation. But that number is not verified due to all of the corruption. Today, most of Fordlandia is largely abandoned, although it has seen a small population boom in recent years thanks to a growing tourist industry funded by travelers eager to see the remnants of Ford's jungle town firsthand. Now barges sail upriver from Santa Ram carrying tourists on an eight-hour boat ride into the town. It's a far cry from Ford's original vision, to be sure. However, the venture did result in something positive, as Fordlandia's hospital remains open to this day and continues to treat patients. Likewise, the town's school has educated hundreds of Brazilian children throughout the years, and in this way, a tiny part of Ford's dream, the part that genuinely wanted to help the Brazilian people, as misguided as his methods were, lives on.